survivors survived before they met us and really speaking to the resiliency that um, the, these individuals experience and how, you know, whether it be standing alongside them as they tell their story um, of their abuse six feet from their perpetrator in court or um, holding their hand through an exam or, you know, working through you, how to sit down and finally tell their their family that it happened with them and being alongside it, like that it, that is such an experience that's next to none and 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 this work is is, is truly awe-inspiring Welcome back to You Need a Counselor podcast. My name is Julie Johnson. I'm the president and founder here at Heart and Solutions. We are a counseling agency here in Iowa offering outpatient mental health therapy for children, couples, families, individual adults, uh, and also offering groups. And we also offer in-home behavioral health intervention services. And I'm Chris Brown. I am the vice president of Heart and Solutions in charge of the behavioral health department. So I'm in charge of the program where we go in home and work with kids ages four to 18 on different behavioral skills. And this is our podcast, You Need a Counselor. So the mission of our podcast is that we are designed for people curious about counseling, but have barriers keeping them from experiencing the benefits of counseling. Our mission is to share stories about counseling, good, bad, and indifferent, and spread the message that everyone can benefit from mental health and behavioral health counseling services. Yeah, so we post on Sunday nights, so don't forget to save up your laundry throughout the week and put it away on Sunday nights while you can listen to the podcast. That gives you the entire week uh, to get in touch with your counselor, call your counselor and schedule if you're not scheduled for the week or get in touch with a new counselor and get started for services this week. Uh, Also, nobody wants to do their laundry alone (laughs) or in the middle of the week. So just know if you save it all up, batch up all your clean laundry for Sunday night, Krista and I will be putting that away with you and you won't be alone while you do that horrible, excruciating task. So today we are very, very lucky. We've got Emily Parker and Nora Heaton here with us today from the Riverview Center. And if you are in Iowa, you've likely heard of the Riverview Center, um, but they do so many uh, very, very needed things here in our community. And so I'm just really, really excited to be able to highlight not only Emily and Nora, but also uh, the amazing services that are happening down there at the Riverview Center. Um, So Nora comes to us. She has been in crisis work for 10 years um, and is just so dedicated to responding to mental health crises um, and also has staffed hotlines for uh, suicide prevention and substance abuse intervention. So comes to us from a rich uh, background of different ways of supporting people who are in crisis in our community. So welcome, Nora. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Glad to be here. (laughs) Yeah, and we've got Emily Parker, um, who is the Associate Program Director at the Riverview Center, um, and oh my goodness, is currently studying to, you're going to get your LMHC, which is exciting, yeah. so don't <laughs> don't forget about us when, <laughs> when graduation time comes around, um, although I know that you guys have therapists out there uh, at the Riverview Center as well, um, but that's very exciting, um, and Emily is just very, very passionate about breaking down barriers uh, that survivors of of sexual violence or domestic violence um, are experiencing and really just empowering um, those survivors through your work. So Emily, welcome. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. Happy to be here. Absolutely. So can you guys tell us just for anybody who doesn't know about the Riverview Center, can you give us a, a window into what it what it's like there? What services you all provide? Nora, do you want to speak? <laughs> sure. <laughs> Uh, Well, Riverview Center uh, provides support services for survivors of sexual violence. Um, So we have a, we we serve all of, or not all of, we serve 14 counties in Northeast Iowa. That's right. The the number's right, Emily. Is that, okay. And then two counties in Illinois. Um, And the the office that I work out of serves Lynn, Benton, and Jones counties. Um, So what we do is 
really any kind of support service that makes sense and is in the direction of healing from sexual violence for a survivor. Um, and that's the case, whether their trauma was recent or a long time ago, um, it can be medical advocacy, you know, responding in the ER sometimes. Um, if someone comes in recently uh, after an assault, um, it can be legal advocacy. We help out with um, accompanying survivors to court proceedings, um, law enforcement interviews. Um, and then we also just do any kind of personal financial um, advocacy that makes sense for a survivor as well as peer counseling. Um, so it's, it's very individualized, very survivor centered. Um, we pretty much are, are just happy to help in whatever way seems to make sense um, for a survivor at the time. Yeah, and I also wanted to mention that our services, our promise is that our services are 100% free. So, you know, if you think about the partner who wants to access and work on their historical trauma, um, they don't have to worry about their insurance company getting billed and then notifying their partner at home about it. We're also 100% confidential as well. So even like conversations between Nora and myself, um, Per the state of Iowa, we are permissive reporters, not mandatory. So we can really process a lot of that healing that maybe somebody lives in fear of it being reported about. Um, and we get to be that silent, supportive partner alongside any journey that they go through. Um, and then a lot of our services are very focused in mobile advocacy. So meeting people where they're at especially recognizing the barriers that exist for rural communities. I live in a rural community. And so, you know, we, as we know, resources aren't as prevalent. Mm -hmm. um, advocates like Nora work very diligently to travel there, meeting in safe spaces that the survivor feels comfortable in as well. Wow. So, I mean, so many of the barriers that we talk about on this show in terms of barriers to mental health, you guys at the Riverview Center are able to overcome, um, so in a systemic way, overcome a lot of those barriers for the survivors that you are working with. Um, and that's amazing. So we hear a lot about financial barriers to starting counseling and uh, either at the Riverview Center, all of the services are free, are no cost, which is amazing because with the financial barrier, it's not only having the funds sometimes, but it is the billing. It's where is that EOB going to go if my insurance company has uh, has been billed? Um, is, is my partner or former partner going to get that EOB? And now they know where I'm going to be on Tuesdays, right? Um, and so you, you have uh, been able to overcome that financial barrier systemically. Mandatory reporting. Um, I remember you guys did a training at the um, UNI Trauma Informed Conference. Uh, and I remember being so mind blown when I heard that you guys are permissive yeah. reporters um, and just so, like, what? It was like a, another reality, <laughs> right? Because uh, mandatory reporting um, for dependent adults and dependent children um, in, in, our state and, and across the country, we've got to, as mental health counselors, we've got to report those instances um, to DHS. Whereas, uh, and that can cause a lot of challenges and barriers for people even starting the service because they know that they don't have, they've got the safe space to, uh, to discuss what's happening, but they also know that there are some things they don't get to have control over, which is, do we report this or not? Um, and with you guys, they do have complete control over that, um, which is just huge for client autonomy. Um, I think that's amazing that you're, you're able to, uh, to really provide that full range of choices uh, for that client. So how would somebody um, get started? How would somebody know that you might be a service that can benefit them? And then if they do identify that, then how can they get in touch with you guys? So I feel like we, <laughs> there's such a variety of ways that, you know, River becomes a part of survivors' families. Um, what most people attribute it to maybe avenues of when we're crisis responders and we go into those hospitals and we support somebody through a sexual assault exam. 
or maybe somebody reaches out, like law enforcement reaches out because they have a report, but really less than 10% of our services are actually involved in the justice system. A majority of our referrals come from, you know, peer-to-peer families, um, other community providers, um, you know, school systems. We've seen a large uptick in youth teenage specific referrals or concerned family members who has a survivor in their life. Um, it, a very vast variety of ways in, in which they access and predominantly, I, I would say phone call, but we do have working relationships with other community providers that um, we have like an email system um, but we also, and I'll have Nora speak to this, we also hold space in which we understand that trauma occurs the most within those vulnerable communities, such as our local homeless shelters. And I'll have Nora kind of talk about what that referral, that very unique referral process looks like there and what her experience of holding space looks like as well. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, I mean, part of Part of, part of what we know is that, um, you know, people who are marginalized in one area are often marginalized in many areas. And so um, I think that, unfortunately, it tends to be true for, um, for people who are experiencing homelessness that their, their rate of victimization is a lot higher. And so um, with that knowledge, we've been um, partnering with our local homeless uh, services provider in this, this provider specifically is in Cedar Rapids. Um, in Lynn County. And um, what what we've been doing is just holding um, advocate hours basically at the shelter. Um, so that means, you know, um, I'll sort of walk around, I'll introduce who I am, um, what Riverview Center is. Um, sometimes people ask me questions that have nothing to do with counseling or Riverview services or anything. And they just kind of continue talking to me for a while. And then afterwards they say, actually, I also would like <laughs> to access your services. And, um, and so I try to just um, connect with people, you know, on the basis of, you know, everyone, everyone is, is, you know, worth listening to, and everyone is worth that, you know, the elements of counseling. And then a lot of times, people will end up disclosing kind of midway into our interaction, um, which suggests to me that people are seeking the service, but aren't sure how to ask, which is kind of, you know, part of what I think this, this podcast gets at is that, um, you know, sometimes people will identify in, in some sort of unspoken way, like maybe I, I could benefit from counseling, or maybe I could access the service, but I'm not quite sure. I'm not quite sure how to ask. I don't really want to approach anyone about it. And um, so what we think is important as a part of advocacy and a part of counseling is going to places where those people are going to be and just offering our services without any expectation. Um, and a lot of times people have, have really um, said that they appreciated that and that they would not have accessed our services otherwise. Absolutely. Wow. I mean, just the, the ability for you guys to be there in the same room, right, with, with somebody who potentially could need the services. And even if they don't need the services that day, they might need those services in a week. Um, and so the fact that they have seen your face, they've talked to you about the snow, right, or the weather or any other number of things, um, they've already started to have the opportunity to build a relationship with you, even if they've never talked to you, but they've seen you around or they've seen you interact with people that they know. Um, you're, you're establishing yourself there. And that's such a preventative measure so that when people who, when people do need the service, they know when they can find you, right? They know that, okay, I don't need to try to find a phone book and, and call all these random numbers and talk to all these random people because Nora's going to be here at four o'clock today. Right. And so I know that I can talk to her. And I think that those conversations that happen that are, are random conversations and not necessarily right. Like, Oh, Hey, what do you, what do you think about this or that? Those are so important too, because you are building those relationships. You're establishing that trust. Um, so that's amazing. And so you do this at, at the um, shelter there in Lynn County. Are there other areas that you guys travel out to and, and spend time in, in the state? 
Yeah, I can definitely speak to that more. Um, I, as the associate program director, serve all 14 counties. So we have four different offices um, so that we can make sure that our mobile advocacy is within one hour responding time from that office. So uh, one of the other models that we also have is out of our Dubuque office with a domestic violence, sexual violence shelter there as well. Um, you know, sometimes the hardest part about accessing, service, accessing services is picking up the phone, which is why we've started going to this holding space model. And uh, we have advocate hours there just engaging with the women and their children to kind of navigate what does this process look like. I think also with these types of advocacy roles or positioning, um, you know, the, especially people from vulnerable communities don't speak provider language. And what we have found is, well, I called this place or I called this place and I haven't heard back or, you know, yeah, I talked to somebody and, you know, they asked me some questions, but I'm not like I, you know, they, they said they couldn't help me. But what we have found is, is through provider advocacy and, you know, being the forefront face of that, being able to speak to provider language um, is that these people who exist within these spaces are actually able to access services even more. So that might look like, okay, culturally, this person does not understand what domestic violence looks like or sexual violence looks like. Really slow it down for them. Do you, you know, English is not their first language. Do you have access to language lines to ensure the understanding? Are you being culturally competent as you're working through your assessment? And what we have found is that, you know, through these different pieces and holding space and being the face of maybe that survivor in those different avenues, they're able to access those additional services as well. Um, we are also involved on our campuses. So going and having space there, working with our Title IX offices, um, students knowing that they can come and receive free services from us too. What a great point about the barrier of getting connected with other services, because in each field, there tends to be jargon <laughs> that gets used, like there tends to be the, these terms that get used. But at the same time, counselors or attorneys or, you know, doctors are also not always familiar um, with the terminology that might be used or are not always familiar with the experience that the, the survivor might be portraying or letting them know about. Um, and so I think that that advocacy that you guys are doing, kind of being able to be the person who goes with them or makes the phone call with them. Um, I know that, I mean, going to court for any reason is very scary, even if it's a traffic ticket, right? Like I'm not a fan of that. Um, and so they, being able to have somebody by your side who's been through it, you know, and who knows what to expect and who knows what, um, what the options are here uh, is so important. Or when you're at the hospital, um, just being able to have somebody to kind of translate what the doctor might be saying. And that's, you know, I feel like that's any population. I've been to the doctor and they've said things to me about medication and I've been like, I don't know what you're saying, but like, let me write that down phonetically so I can Google it later. Right? <laughs> like, I don't, I don't always know. And so, you know, if you are in the midst of that traumatic situation and, and the doctor is telling you these things, um, the, the chances of, you know, anybody really understanding exactly what that doctor is saying um, are a lot lower. And so I think for, for somebody to just be there with you um, and be able to let you know what to expect, um, that's huge, you know, and then to process what happened later on, because, you know, I, I'm one of those people, I'm a afterwards processor, right? And so I'll, I'll think about it later and be like, oh, maybe I should have said this, or right, maybe I should have told the judge that or, or this. And for, for you guys to be there and say, nope, you, you did exactly what, what we planned right? That's why we plan it out. And just to be able to give that validation um, after the experience too, I think is just so, so valuable. So which campuses are you guys on now? 
I know you're at you and I. <laughs> I know <Yes>. that. <laughs> <laughs> we are, I think we, I mean, we are on for our Cedar Rapids office, Kirkwood, um, Mount Mercy, Co. But, uh, and then we are working on having space at Loris and Dubuque. We are. I'm trying to think of all these campuses because they're so involved in different types of levels and they've changed so much throughout the pandemic. So I, I, I guess the better answer to that question is we are involved in all of our campuses. They just look different and how what that involvement looks like. So I know for Cedar Rapids, we have preset office hours and we also have it in other um, places like such as you and I, but that might also look different different of being involved in sexual assault awareness month activities with take back the night um, being a part of panel discussions as well it just really depends so what was it that got each of you involved in the Riverview Center and got you you involved in this kind of advocacy well I can start I I think that um you know in the type of crisis work that I had been doing before um which was just any type of mental health crisis. Um, I noticed that sexual trauma was a theme that came up again and again and again and again. And um, and it was often not something that we had a lot of time to delve into because it, you know, it was often just sort of an acute crisis situation. And, um, and you know, it was something that the person was so clearly affected by um, and, and, you know, I had identified that they wanted long-term support with it, um, but, there, there just wasn't time in, in the couple of hours that we had together. And, um, and so I really appreciate about being an advocate that, um, that I have the time that I can really sit with someone and as they process that, um, you know, whether, whether it is a short-term situation or a long-term situation that they would like our services. Um, it's, it's just really nice to be able to focus on something that is, is so makes such a difference in someone's life. Um, you know, to have advocacy in that way. So, um, so I've, I've really just, I've especially appreciated being able to do this because of just zeroing in on this one area um, of mental health services. Yeah, I think for me, it's much like Nora is, as I've navigated the world of working with people in, in different spaces, you know, sexual violence has been a a huge factor for a lot of different people in, the, in their process, you know, from working with youth in the inpatient level and, and seeing the adversity that they have come through. I remember, you know, my, my first experience as a social worker of, you know, what are the resulting behaviors of experiencing sexual violence, especially in youth and like how that was um, very significant and how that continuance in working in the recovery community and um, doing education on how substances exist within these communities, but really looking at different de determining factors and how substance use is really a coping mechanism um, for experiencing that level of trauma and you know continuing on through this and having the opportunity and really it's a privilege to work with survivors because foundationally all of our work is built on the premise of empowerment. We never tell a survivor what to do. We're really there along the journey, which can be hard for a lot of people because we're like red flags, like, whoa, <laughs> what are you doing here? But, um, but I, we, we always have to remember, and I'll never forget when our program director said this to me, is that survivors survived before they met us and really speaking to the resiliency that um, the, these individuals experience and how, you know, whether it be standing alongside them as they tell their story um, of their abuse six feet from their perpetrator in court or, you um, holding their hand through an exam or, um, you know, working through you, how to sit down and finally tell their, their family that it happened with them and being alongside it, like that, it, that is such an experience that's next to none. And, and, and this work is, is, is truly awe-inspiring. I think there's, I, I think it's just so amazing the, the kind of spectrum of services that you 
provide and the support because you know when when I th- when you mention the these follow up things that have to happen right that are so challenging and difficult and I think that it, in our society we have a tendency to kind of compartmentalize sexual assault and we think sexual assault you know go to the hospital, right? And then and then maybe go to counseling um, through that, right? But there are all of these other pieces telling telling family members and telling our external supports. Um, I mean, that is, that's something that I had not thought about until you said that. Um, and what and what a gift it would be to have somebody else in there with us, right? Mm-hmm. To have that kind of third party in there with our family members and know that that's an advocate for us and that we do get to control as much as we can about the circumstances of that situation. Of course, we can't control our family members or their reactions to it, but we can at least know that at the end of it, we're going to have somebody who was there who can process that with us. We're going to have somebody there that can, can end it right? If it starts to get abusive or, or we need to, to excuse ourselves. Um, and that's huge. That reminds me of like, when I had my daughter, um, I had this fantastic midwife who was like, you, we have a signal. And as soon as you do that signal, I am kicking everybody out of this room. Right? Like, and I just, I just loved that. Cause I thought, oh my gosh, this is so great because it's your family, you know, and you, you want to, to be able to uh, have these, these conversations with your family, but at the same time, because it's your family, it's much harder to have those boundaries and those protections in place for yourself. So the fact that they would have an advocate um, in there with them that is in your side um, is, is amazing. So, wow. And then of course, yeah, court proceedings um, and having somebody be able to explain that and explain what's going to happen. Um, it's just incredible. And just to be there, like just a, a person in that room that cares about you. It, like, I mean, that's so important. Um, so yeah, the work that you guys are doing is fantastic. Um, have you seen, because there's such a, a wide variety, it seems, of what sexual violence looks like and or what it what it is at this time. And so, um, you know, Nora, you, you brought up the point and I thought it was such a great point of, you know, within, so within health overall, mental health is such a huge part of that. Mental health is um, impacts, right? All the other pieces of our health. And then within mental health, our, you know, sexual trauma is, has such a huge impact on a person's overall mental health and it impacts all of the different pieces of our mental health. Um, have you guys found over the last uh, years that you've been working at the Riverview Center or just that you've been working in crisis intervention, um, have you seen a change in sexual assault or, or what, what we're now recognizing is sexual assault? Um, or community response. Have you guys seen changes over the last couple of years? I think that one thing I've noticed just, and, and this, I don't, don't necessarily have the data to back it up, but something I just have sort of sensed is that um, I've, I've heard more people speak on it than I previously had. And, um, and even, you know, on um, campuses or, um, you know, specific communities where, you um, where people will disclose and it will be reported and, and it will be um, forwarded to the community that happens a lot at on campuses. They'll, you know, they'll forward to the campus community that then an assault um, has been reported, that kind of thing. Um, I, I recall that when I was in school 10 years ago, that that didn't happen very often that there, that there was such an email that was sent out. And I noticed that in, in later years that started happening more. And um, I had, I had sort of talked to some people about it and they'd said, well, more people are being assaulted. And I said, I don't know if it's that more, more assaults are taking place as much as more people are, you know, able to access services for it. And yes. that is encouraging, mm-hmm. you know, it's, I think it's, it's so important that, you know, if, if that occurs, that people have have the resources that they need for it. And, and I feel encouraged knowing that those resources are um, at least being talked about more often and more freely. Yeah, there was a great article done by the Telegraph Herald in Dubuque recently, and it was on a study 
of uh, like crime that exists in the Dubuque community because predominantly it's been statistically going down, but they've seen an uptick since the pandemic. And what they had found it was what the highest increases were domestic violence and sexual violence. And um and there was this continued conversation of, oh, the pandemic, you know, isolation, stuff like that, which, yes, very much so, you know, most survivors know their perpetrator. And with this isolation, there is an increase. And as things have opened up, we've seen a lot of self-referrals, family referrals, school referrals. But I also would like that to attribute to at least a hope of increased understanding in our communities of what this looks like and that there is options and that justice doesn't have to look like one thing and um, that these resources exist to work together as well. Um, and more, more people are reporting because there are more systems that are being set up for survivors because what people don't realize is that um, that a lot of a lot of these systems aren't set up for them. You know, if you think of of all of the reports in the criminal justice system of sexual violence, um, if the county attorney picks them up, of those a thousand, thousand only five lead to successful conviction. Wow. And when you talk to people who have been in the industry, like working with survivors for a very long time that know the ins and outs that are, truly are the experts, they will tell you nine times out of 10 that they would never report because, you know, you have, and which is why our work is so important because it's existing because of the barriers in our systems. To have somebody in your life that doesn't ask you questions of, well, you sure you weren't high? Or like, why were you going that way? Or you were like a block from the police station. Like, mm, like all these different questions when you have somebody that answers the phone and says, you know, hi, I'm Emily. Um, how are you doing today? And they say, you know, I'm just not doing that well. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm here for you. I believe you. You don't have to tell your story to work with us. Like, I think that that is just the be like the wonderful silver lining in that. And I think through the pandemic and as things have changed, advocates have had the biggest hand in policy work and awareness and community understanding. So my and I'm starting to see the shift, hopefully, and um, and people being able to work with survivors of this trauma even more, and and have a, a greater sense of. Um, how the systems and interact with each other and getting coming to a table to discuss these different issues as well. Yeah, I think you guys are so right. It's, it's not that there are more sexual assaults happening. It's not that there's more intimate partner violence happening at home. It's that there are more, there, there are more people willing to hear that. Uh, there are more people willing to support uh, survivors and to believe survivors um, and to take action, like send out an email so that everybody know, you know, and so um, I think that I think you're so right. And that's so interesting about the pandemic, um, how once things started to open again, schools and people went back to campuses and, um, and people started going back to work, how those referrals kind of mm -hmm. started coming um, back in again. And it just sheds such a light on how much darkness and, and shadow there is on especially intimate partner violence, which is in the home um, or sexual assault that's being perpetrated by an intimate partner that's in the home, that's behind closed doors. Um, and without those those communities, uh, resources, being able to have the understanding of what to look for and also who to connect um, this person to, uh, then, then that stays behind closed doors um, and that person stays uh, isolated. And um, isolation, and you guys had talked about um, financial abuse and how you know that is such a factor in intimate partner violence and, and abuse. And then um, also, the isolation, the isolation is huge and the pandemic isolated everybody. Um, and, and so I, that, that makes a lot of sense that, that, that those types of um, violent attacks would 
be increased because uh, abusive relationships and, and abusers, they love mm-hmm. isolation. They love it. Uh, and it kind of created that environment. Um, but it, it does make me hopeful too. Like Emily was saying that as soon as those opened up, we started having people be able to access those supports again, um, which really does show the, the power of those community networks and the fact that they are working because look at the alternative um, when you're, you know, everything was shut down. So that's incredible. And to add something too, you know, about the sort of the, the isolation aspect of the pandemic, I've also been able to talk to some people who, um, especially especially people who have had trauma from their distant past, um, and they just, it, it's much more in their mind um, as they've been isolated and as they've been homebound or, or whatever the case is. Um, I've gotten, I've gotten um, you know, contact from people who maybe are um, you know, in their 70s now who uh, suffered childhood trauma and now it's, it's come up for them in a way that it hadn't previously because they were busy or, um, you know, they had more distractions in their lives or or whatever the case is. That's something that, um, you know, the pandemic has impacted current, you know, uh, incidents of, of trauma, but it also has, has brought up a lot of past trauma for people too, I think. Absolutely. And that, I mean, that is so eye-opening because it really highlights the fact that that trauma is there. It's, it's been there for those 70 years. Um, It's been there the whole time. And we do, we create coping strategies around it, right? We, we find ways to, to survive and continue. Um, even if at that time that it happened, we weren't offered the support, the support maybe didn't exist at that time. Like Emily said, right? People survived, (laughs) people survived before the services. And so, um, and I mean, that's a beautiful way for you guys as advocates to be able to look at, um, a family that is in crisis, to be able to say, they know what they need to do, right? I'm, I'm here to do resource and I'm here to be a person that's here for them. And that that's all I need to do. And that, that takes a lot of that pressure off of you guys um, to be like, oh, I need to know the answers. Like, no, you don't. They know. They know, which is great. Um, but then this idea that that trauma has been there, if they didn't get the opportunity to process that trauma when it happened, right? Or even throughout their lifetimes, because yeah, kids and family and, you know, all of those things kind of pile up. Um, But then having this kind of very quick vacuum of so many things of the distractions in our lives, um, it it reveals what was already there, what was there the entire time. That's incredible. That's an amazing way to look at it. Um, I I love that perspective. I hadn't, I hadn't thought of that before either. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So now do you guys do individual counseling there, like long, longer term counseling there at the centers? Can you tell us about what that looks like? Well, I can speak to what the, the peer counseling looks like in, in terms of advocacy. And then there's also um, therapy services offered too, um, which are also free. Um, but as, as far as the counseling through advocacy, one thing that I notice is you know, it, it looks as, as varied as our survivors are, you know, and so sometimes people will, um, will come to their counseling appointment um, for their first appointment, and they'll say, I'm really not ready to share all that I want to share, but I know, I know it's there, but I'm not ready at this moment. And so um, we'll talk about other things, and we'll, you know, provide the, the aspects of counseling in, you know, in a way that doesn't directly address the trauma, but still indirectly addresses the trauma, if you know what I mean. It, um, like a lot of times people will um, want to, one, one thing that's come up a lot recently is people will want to talk about um, music and the music that's been meaningful to them and the lyrics that they've particularly liked that have helped them through um, times that have been difficult for them. And so um, in doing that, you know, we're able to see the, the coping skills that they like. Um, we're able to see the the ideas that have brought them hope. And so those, those are all pieces of information for me that I can use in better advocating for them in the future. And also things that they can see that they've already identified because that's sort of the point of the whole empowerment philosophy is that, you know, as we've been saying, the survivors that we work with have survived a hundred percent of the crises that they have ever experienced. They are 
a hundred percent the experts in their own survival. They they know what they're doing, you know, and um, and so we're just there to to facilitate that, you know, and to and to help people see, you know, to because sometimes it helps to have someone else pointed out of um, how adept you are at surviving, and um, and so that's that's kind of one one thing that I think is is important to point out about peer counseling in terms of advocacy is that it doesn't necessarily have to look the way sometimes we imagine counseling might look, you know, the way it maybe is portrayed in media, things like that of, um, you know, very, very specific to let's discuss your trauma. Let's discuss how it makes you feel and let's discuss the origins of, you know, and, and that's, there's, there's room for all of that. And there's also room for other things. And um, I think too, and I can speak a little bit more to our, our therapy services is that, um, a lot, so I would say a lot of adults who have had a recent sexual trauma experience will enter being like, yeah, I want to go to therapy. Like, let's do this, you know? And then they're like, oh, wait, just kidding. And predominantly work with, you know, advocacy, doing a lot of that skill building and stuff like that. Our, um, but our therapists are absolutely wonderful we under, we recognize the need for therapy as a tool within healing. And so we have, you know, state of the art play therapy rooms for kids that come in. Um, our therapists are also trained in EMDR. So, uh, so you can kind of make that connection as to why it's a little intensive at first. Um, and so we'll, we'll do that. And that is free as well. They, the, the, our therapists do not do billable hours which is unheard of. So um, that's kind of a unique experience. And the therapists and the advocates work side by side and do a lot of case review and discussion to ensure that the whole family is supported and that there's continual tools as they go as well. And our therapists also travel. That's so one cool. thing that I can add with that too, that, um, you know, and again, my perspective is, is more the, the advocacy for counseling, but I do like that. Um, I think advocacy kind of provides a transition into some counseling without it feeling as um, intimidating sometimes, because there have been, especially, um, this has come up a number of times with, um, like, I, I do work sometimes in um, the the county jail here um, in Cedar Rapids, where sometimes people will be um, calling because they have, um, you know, a specific, uh, a specific incident that they want to discuss. Um, And then as we discuss that, and I provide advocacy based on that, then sometimes people will just start kind of disclosing other things that maybe they, they didn't call me there to discuss those things, but it's just kind of come up in conversation. And then we you know, we go into a, a bunch of different directions that maybe no one anticipated, but are ultimately helpful for the healing from this incident. And, um, and so that's, that's one setting that I, I just noticed it comes up a lot because people will, um, you know, people will open up if they're given the space to open up. It just is hard sometimes to actually say, this space is what I need right now, <laughs> which is why the, the holding space idea is so helpful, I think. And, and the idea of just being present um, where people are is so helpful because, um, you know, then it, then it provides that opportunity without someone having to ask for it. And I really like that. Absolutely. So if, if there's anybody listening to this podcast that thinks that, well, maybe my maybe I could use uh, some of these supports or maybe my sister maybe could use these supports. Um, How would you, what would you say to them and how would you recommend that they go about getting, getting support for themselves or for their loved one? What I would say to them is that, you know, obviously we're hundred percent free and confidential, but also you may work with an advocate, but you're really gifted the entire organization and we, and we become a part of your family when you do access our services um, and you are 100% believe and you are supported and you get to drive the bus and we get to let ride along with you on whatever that journey healing looks like. Um, and they can access us you know, 24-7, 365, if it's crisis, we'll dispatch out 
three o'clock in the morning or three o'clock in the afternoon. Um, our crisis line for the state sorry about that, also has trained advocates as well. So if they just need middle of the night, I had a night terror, I just need to speak to somebody, an advocate is available for that through the state of Iowa. Um, and they would just call our 888 crisis line number and to access our services whenever. And they can leave a message with them or they can also walk into one of our four offices in Decorah, Waterloo, Dubuque and Cedar Rapids as well, Monday through thri- Friday, 8.30 to 4.30. Perfect. We will put all of that information in the show notes too, all of the phone numbers, all of the locations yes. um, so that, you know, it, it, for us, it's about knowing what services are available before we need them. Um, And because in our lifetime, statistically, somebody, either ourselves or somebody that we love is going to need a service like the Riverview Center. And so we want to make sure that uh, when that happens, that everybody is is as prepared as, as we can be in terms of what is offered. So... That's amazing. Well, thank you so much for being here, Emily and Nora. This has been really, really fun and really, really informative. Um, I know that I've gotten to hear um, some very different, but very sound uh, different perspectives that I I wouldn't have thought of. I never would have thought about um, that process of, you know, talking to a family, talking to your family about uh, the sexual violence that has happened. That is um, is amazing advocacy work that you guys are doing. So well done. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thank, thank you so much for having us. Any opportunity that we get to raise awareness about advocacy looks like we definitely want to be a part of and just know that even if you haven't gone through the advocacy certification, you do have an ability to advocate for those loved ones and, and close people in your life and in any avenue just by stating that you believe them and being along the journey with them as well and getting access to all that information that you can so i'm emily parker from riverview center and i need a counselor mm-hmm. nora <laughs> I'm Nora Heaton, also from Riverview Center, and I need a counselor. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So do we, (laughs) by the way. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So thank you to Emily and Nora for being here. Um, We are Krista and Julie. We are from Heart and Solutions. So uh, we are offering uh, in-person and telehealth services on the phone and on the computer for mental health, uh, but also for kiddos. So um, if you've got kiddos ages 4 to 18 that just need some additional support with like communication skills or how do I resolve conflicts uh, when I start school right for the first time in months, uh, go ahead and give us a call there and we will uh, come to your house and do those behavioral health intervention services as well. 800-531-4236. Absolutely. Um, If you've got questions for us about counseling, or if you've got questions about the Riverview Center or specific questions for Emily or Nora about their journey uh, or about the advocacy that they do, um, feel free to message us on Facebook Messenger at You Need a Counselor Podcast, uh, or uh, you can DM us on Instagram at You Need a Counselor. Um, And then we would love to have Emily and Nora on for another interview. And then we will go ahead and ask them those questions on the podcast for you. So that we can share those answers with everybody. I'm Krista Brown. And I'm Julie Johnson. And we need a counselor. And so do you. Bye. Bye.